The NFL Combine is not only the official start to the 2022 NFL Draft season, but it's also an unofficial start to the NFL offseason altogether because you've got all 32 NFL teams under the same roof, which makes it essentially a super spreader event for NFL rumors. Hopefully this will lead to some clarification on the quarterback carousel because we've got Aaron Rodgers, Deshaun Watson, Jimmy Garoppolo, Mitch Trubisky, Carson Wentz, Russell Wilson, and the first two picks from the 2015 NFL Draft, Jameis Winston and Marcus Mariota, all of which could be playing for new teams in 2022, which is really going to impact where some of these below average quarterback prospects get mock drafted to. This is my second mock draft of the year, so I did include two trades, but my third mock is the one that gets kind of wild with the projected trades, so subscribe so you get notified whenever I drop some new NFL Draft content. My goal is to hit 50,000 subscribers by the NFL Draft. Please join me on my journey to 50k. Also, I work my butt off making these the literal best mock drafts on the internet. Like NFL teams, sometimes I miss on the picks, but at least when that happens, I can pride myself on having the nicest presentation. So please do me the favor of hitting the like button if you can see the extra detail that I put into this video even if you don't agree with the actual pick. I'm dropping this right before the NFL Combine to avoid overreactions but I do want to hear your overreactions to the NFL Combine so please tell me a player that you think had a significant performance whether it be good or bad and I also want to hear the juicy NFL draft rumors that start floating around and if it seems legit I might feature your comments in my next mock draft. I don't know about you guys, but I love the fact that there isn't a clear-cut number one overall pick in this class. Debating how the Jaguars should play this year is one of my favorite parts about this particular draft season. These draft discussions are kind of like arguing about politics. They're passionate. They can get just as tense, but without the toxicity. The Bengals draft debate from last year will go down as one of the all-time NFL draft debates, especially after riding that pick all the way to a Super Bowl berth. Now the Jaguars have a chance to build on their second consecutive number one overall pick, and I'm staying strong with Kayvon Thibodeau as the pick. This is not only what I would do, but what I think will actually happen happen with the pick. The Jaguars are reportedly considering using the franchise tag on Cam Robinson once again. Pair that with them spending a second round pick on Walker Little last year and Evan Neal kind of creates an abundancy at offensive tackle. Honestly this is less of a debate for me than is being made out there. I think that mocking Evan Neal here at number one is just the easier route for the mock draftee because when it comes down to it pass rushers with a ceiling this high do not grow on trees and the Kayvon Thibodeau's film from 2020 is going to trump Aiden Hutchinson's 2021 film. Another one of my favorite parts of these draft debates is stubbornly being able to dig my heels in when I feel strongly about something, like the Mac Jones rumors last year. I absolutely refused to mock him to the 49ers at number three because I had more faith in Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch making the right choice. If it was Dan Campbell making this pick, you know it'd be a kneecap biter, but ultimately it's not his call. So for this mock, I would like to introduce you to the Lions GM, Brad Holmes. He was hired last year as the Lions GM after getting his personnel start with the Rams. And in 2013, he was hired as the Rams director of college scouting. That means Brad Holmes was at least partially responsible for the Rams drafting Aaron Donald and Cooper Cup. Then his first move with the Lions was trading Matthew Stafford. I think the Rams should probably think about sending this man a Super Bowl ring to be honest. Well this year the early draft rumor is that the Lions are interested in Malik Willis after coaching him at the Senior Bowl and possibly as early as the number two overall pick. That's crazy right? I mean I did have them taking him at number 32 in my last mock with Aiden Hutchinson here and that would be insane value. Why would the Lions take Willis at number two when they could get him later on. Well, they could try and trade down, maybe to number six if the Panthers want one of the top offensive tackles, but does anyone ever trade up in the top five for an offensive lineman? Not really. If I'm Brad Holmes and the Panthers came knocking for number two, I'm kind of assuming that it's for a quarterback. And if Malik Willis is my guy, then you can't let another team just jump in front of you. And I'm afraid if the Lions want Malik Willis, they're going to have to take him sooner than that. And just because he went to Liberty doesn't mean that he can't go in the top five. Steve McNair went to Alcorn State. He's probably not the prospect that Steve McNair was, but Willis has got the most intriguing skill set of any quarterback in this draft class. And as your resident Central Virginia NFL scout, I can tell you that the word on these mountain streets is that he is a quality human being, a great team leader, and he responds really well to coaching. To me, that sounds like the kind of guy that Dan Campbell would sign off on as the quarterback of the future. And I know some of you guys are going to discredit the rest of this mock just because of this one pick. I'm not doing it for shock value. And I promise you later, you're going to think about this and realize that it actually does make a lot of sense with Jared Goff having one more year on his contract and how many more times can the Lions actually even finish in the bottom five of the league and retain Dan Campbell as the head coach and for those that are saying that the Lions should just trade up from 32 take him in the mid to late teens well I'm posting this before the NFL combine so that after he dominates all the drills there and everybody realizes that he's not going to be there I can say I told you so beforehand and if nothing else I got to give the uh this aged poorly crowd something to do after the draft this April 
At number three, the Texans are cleaning house and Laramie Tunsil is going to be traded by the end of this mock draft. Shout out to Balin in my live stream the other day for bringing this trade scenario to my attention, but you're gonna have to stay tuned to see where he ends up because Laramie Tunsil is gonna cost too much money on the cap and after only playing in five games last year, the Texans could still trade him while his value is high, maybe not as high as the two first rounders that Bill O'Brien traded, but if he comes out and only gives them five games again next year due to injury, the Texans probably wouldn't even be able to get a first for him anymore. So with the Texans at number three, it's almost a guarantee that one of the top two offensive tackles will be there. I'm going with Evan Neal, but it wouldn't shock me if it was Iki Iquanu. But stay tuned, Texans fans, because you're back on the clock later in this mock draft. At number four, we've got the Jets, and in this Malik Willis draft scenario, the Jets are left with the second best prospect available at their positions of greatest need, which kind of seems like a very Jets-like scenario, to be honest. They're always the little brother. But luckily for them, Aiden Hutchinson and Iki Mokwanu are more like 1B to Kayvon Thibodeau and Evan Neal. And despite using two consecutive first-round picks on the offensive line, Iki Mokwanu is as much of a slam dunk here as Evan Neal would be to the Texans. But with Aiden Hutchinson still on the board, the Jets are left with a much harder decision because they truly are a mess at edge. With their only legit starter coming off of an Achilles injury. Aiden Hutchinson isn't one of my favorite prospects in this class, but he's an ideal fit across from Carl Lawson, and he's got a relatively high floor, and the Jets are not in a position to miss on any more of these top five picks. The Jets' geographical big brother is on the clock here at number five, and they have their new GM in Joe Shane. Yeah, it's pronounced Shane, even though it's spelled Shone. I don't trust this guy already, but he's lucked out in his first mock draft with Iki Aquanu still being available because Aquanu could be a day one starter at basically any position along the offensive line, not including center, but maybe though. He is that good, hell. If Zion Johnson can learn how to snap on the side of senior bowl practices in a weekend, then it can't be that hard, right? Their left tackle, Andrew Thomas, broke out last year after a rough rookie season. Aquanu could be an all-pro at guard and bring the nastiness that you thought you were getting with Will Hernandez, except he can actually play. However, it's more likely that he starts at right tackle, but it would be interesting to see Andrew Thomas and Iki Aquanu go head-to-head -head in a training camp battle for that left tackle position. Fellas, it's time for us to accept that football season is over and we're going to have to do things other than watch football all weekend. But before you step back out into the real world, we need to talk about your grooming. That's where Manscaped comes in. For those that forgot about Manscaped, this is the only men's brand that is dedicated to below the waist grooming and hygiene. And they are back as the sponsor of my mock drafts. You guys know I'm all about the quality over the quantity and I am a huge fan of Manscaped and the high quality of their perfect package kit. It is the all-in-one grooming toolkit for the modern man. And Manscaped just launched their fourth generation trimmer the newest lawnmower 4.0 and this is the best one yet still has their trademark blades with skin safe technology to keep your little footballs free from scuffs. But my favorite update is the new wireless charging system that uses electromagnetic induction to charge the premium lithium ion battery. Also, I can't wait to take advantage of the new travel lock feature so that it doesn't turn on by accident when I'm on the go. So show Manscaped the same love that you show my videos, check them out. Also use code NFLRT to get that 20% off and free shipping. That'll let them know I sent you. And then they keep helping me produce these mock draft videos for you. Thanks again to Manscaped. Now let's get back to the mock draft. At number six, we've got the Panthers, and they are in a weird place right now draft-wise and team-wise. They aren't high enough in the draft to get one of the top two offensive linemen, and their defense got an entire draft class just two years ago and the number eight overall pick last year. It's this quarterback position that's going to hamstring this team moving forward, and I don't really see an ideal scenario for them to fix it. But whomever ends up as the starter, you can't line him up behind this offensive line, so even though he's a clear-cut number three offensive tackle, I think you got to take Charles Cross here, because when I'm trying to figure out why Deshaun Watson wouldn't waive his no trade clause for the Panthers. Maybe it's the offensive line. Maybe he didn't like his experience in Clemson in the Carolinas, or maybe he didn't see Matt Rule as the program builder that he's been lauded as. However, if Watson isn't traded by the draft, the Panthers could use a revamped offensive line to maybe entice him to consider Carolina once again. Other than that, let me know what you think the best option is for the Panthers at quarterback in 2022. At number seven, the Giants are back on the clock. And even though I already had them go offensive lineman at five, I still strongly considered Tyler Linderbaum here. Yes, the center at number seven overall. That would give the Giants a real strength for the present and the future quarterback. And maybe with those two moves, it would end up being the same guy, even though the Giants are not going to pick up the fifth year option on Daniel Jones. I don't think that means that he is completely done. That's gonna be on Brian Dable, their new head coach, to get the most out of Daniel Jones. So I think that they have got to get Wink Martindale some pieces to play with on defense. Their new defense 
defensive coordinator is the former Ravens linebacker coach. So there is an Aziz Ojolari breakout incoming, especially if they bring back Lorenzo Carter. And with the beefiness they have along the defensive interior, it shouldn't be that hard to get some pass rushers free. I think the Giants want to get back to their roots with strong linebacker play. And I really could see Devin Lloyd being in play here for them at number seven overall. This is one of my favorite prospects in the class because he's got a Micah Parsons kind of game, meaning he can do everything, rush the passer, stop the run, stick with tight ends in the passing game. I think he may end up going way earlier than we all think. I had him fall into the Patriots last mock draft. Now, when I make the Micah Parsons comparison, don't get it twisted. He is not the athlete that Parsons is because they don't make him like that very often. But on top of possessing that all around game from pass rush to pass coverage, Devin Lloyd's also got the leadership that this Giants defense has lacked for a while now. At number eight, we have got the Falcons and they are in the process of restructuring Matt Ryan. So it's looking like he's staying put, which I can respect. We've gotten way too dismissive of older franchise quarterbacks these days. Last year, they got Matt Ryan, the unicorn of the class in Kyle Pitts. And the unicorn of this class is still on the board due to positional value dropping him down a little bit. But positional value didn't stop them from taking a tight end at number four last year. So I think that number eight should be the floor for Kyle Hamilton. He's the best player in the draft class and has the potential to transform a defense in a way that Derwin James does, you know, when he's on the field for the the Chargers. Pairing Kyle Hamilton with their last year second round pick, Richie Grant, would give the Falcons a safety duo with elite potential for years to come. At number nine, we've got the Broncos. Let's start this Broncos breakdown by talking about Mr. A.A. Ron. And I'll admit, I was pulled into the Pat McAfee show to see if he gave any hints. And even though he started it with saying no decision had been made that day, I think he said more in that conversation than if you took his comments for just their surface value. In fact, I actually began to question why he even wanted out in the first place. Yeah, he doesn't like the GM, Gunta Gunst or whatever, but how does he force a trade right now without coming off as the bad guy? Packers fans will go to the ends of the earth for him. The front office has made all these restructures to create cap space to re-sign him so that he can finish his career there. I think that if he forces his way out now, he only alienates himself from a fan base that really respects him. And for most players, I would say it's not even that deep, but for Aaron Rodgers, it kind of is that deep. He's a sensitive fella. So yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm coming back off of my previous draft where I told Packers fans to accept that it was time for him to move on because from a front office standpoint, I would try to get some value out of the guy now. But they also don't want to look like the guys that pushed out Aaron Rodgers. So I'm playing it safe here. I'm saying that Aaron Rodgers doesn't go anywhere and the Broncos are stuck with either picking a quarterback or a pass rusher. I think that's what it comes down to for them. I truly believe that Malik Willis is the only quarterback in this draft class with a ceiling worthy of taking them in the first round. So I'm going to play it safe here and go Jermaine Johnson to replace Von Miller and maybe Bradley Chubb who enters a contract year this year. But that doesn't mean that I've punted on the Broncos quarterback situation. I do think that Russell Wilson would be a great option for them because the Seahawks are not going to want to send him to a team in the NFC. But I really want to know who you think the best option is for the Broncos if Aaron Rodgers decides to stay in Green Bay. At number 10, the Jets are back on the clock and they missed out on the big three at offensive tackle, but they still got to rebuild the right side of this offensive line. They do have two former first rounders at left guard and left tackle. Let's continue to slide down the offensive line and address center with one of the best center prospects we've seen in a long time. Tyler Linderbaum would be Zach Wilson's best friend and would provide more stability for this shaky offensive line than either of the two aforementioned first round offensive linemen. At number 11, we have got the Commanders, and not much has changed here since my last mock, other than the Commanders fixing the championship years on their Crest logo. But yeah, I think that they're the most likely team to trade for a veteran quarterback, and Jimmy Garoppolo does appear to be the top option for him. But for me, I don't agree if it involves pick number 11. I could totally see them doing it, but it's a huge L if they do. Jimmy G has struggled with injuries, and FedEx Field is littered with the ghosts of QB's past. So once again, I pose the question to you guys, who is the best option for the Commanders at quarterback moving forward? I had them drafting Matt Corral last mock draft, but it does seem like they really want to go in with a veteran quarterback. I don't think that Ron Rivera wants to gamble on a rookie because he can't have too many bad seasons like they had last year where he's going to be looking for another new job. He is a defensive guy and assuming the commanders do not part with this number 11 pick, they do have reported interest in signing Joe Hayden or Patrick Peterson. So this signals to me that they really want a stopgap option for the cornerback position with the top cornerbacks on the board. This is a great spot for Derek Stingley. If they did sign Pat Pete, the LSU connection for them could provide Stingley with a great mentor to help him get his body right for the NFL game. 
At number 12, we got the Vikings. They hired Kevin O'Connell, an offensive coach, as you do after having years of a defensive coach. But I think the first pick of the O'Connell era should be on the defensive side of the ball, preferably a pass rusher or a cornerback. Based on the possible scenarios, either Sauce Gardner or Derek Stingley should be available at number 12. But hey, last year they went very quickly. The good news there, though, is that the Vikings are still in a good spot to sit tight and let an impact defender fall into their lap. In this scenario, I've got Sauce Gardner being the pick for them and helping them move past this bad luck streak of picking busts at the cornerback position. At number 13, we've got the Browns. And it's pretty crazy. Odell Beckham Jr. and Jarvis Landry used the Browns to just sort of cross off being NFL teammates off their bucket list. Now it's looking like the Browns are about to move on from both of them in a calendar year. Honestly, I think Baker needs to be the alpha male on offense for him to wake up feeling dangerous on a regular basis. So they might as well overhaul the wide receiver room with young prospects. And there are two or three picks in this draft that just feel like consensus mock draft picks right now. And Garrett Wilson here is one of them. I went with his teammate in my previous mock because I liked the fit more next to Jarvis Landry. But now that it looks like he's going to be cut for cap space and the wide receiver room is getting a big reset, Drake London might be the big go up and get it kind of target that Baker needs to bail him out, you know, when his accuracy falls off a little bit. After all, Mark Andrews was his favorite target during his Heisman campaign at Oklahoma. But I think the Traylon Burks is definitely an option here too. If you're watching this after the NFL Combine, there is a big chance that Traylon Burks has really blown up the NFL Combine and people are going to be shooting him up draft boards, which I'm okay with. I think he's He's my number one wide receiver in this draft class. At number 14, we've got the Baltimore Ravens. And man, I want to give the Ravens Jordan Davis because of the mass exodus along their defensive line this year, but they're just not in a position of luxury to take a player like that, which is kind of uncharacteristic for this team in the draft. It seems like they typically are picking in the early to mid 20s and scooping up all of the value that falls into their lap. But this year, keeping Lamar Jackson upright has got to be the priority of the offseason. And Trevor Penning is a guy that's flying up draft boards, and I love the attitude he plays with. I've been trying to get them to draft a enforcer type to this offensive line since they lost Marshall Yonda. Alejandro Villanueva was a bust of a free agency signing. Penning could be the day one right tackle for the Ravens. At number 15 and 16, the Eagles are up with their back-to-back -back picks, and I think they have to be one of the most likely teams to trade up in the draft, but at the same time, no matter how many Sims I run, they always seem to come away with a stacked first-round group that fills all of their needs with solid value. In this scenario, they've got Trayvon Walker, David Ajabo, Traylon Burks, Jamison William, Andrew Booth, Nicobe Dean all on the board still. With this first pick, I'm going to go ahead and replace Derek Barnett and maybe eventually Brandon Graham with George's Trayvon Walker, but David Ajabo could be more of their flavor if they're looking for more speed. Walker is just the more dominant player at this point in my opinion and honestly he's such a freak and so big that he could end up bulking up and be a replacement for Fletcher Cox down the road if they want to move him inside and then with their second pick the Eagles can hide their wide receiver that would officially declare Jalen Rager a bust Traylon Burks would be a solid compliment to Devontae Smith as he's the big physical target to the smaller finesse style from Smith but honestly you could flip-flop these two wide receivers that I have going first the Browns and the Eagles and I could totally see that being the way that this plays out also with both teams still coming away really happy with the play that they get. At number 17, we've got the Chargers, and I mentioned there were a few consensus mock draft picks right now, with Garrett Wilson to the Browns being one of them. Well, Jordan Davis is the other one, and I actually didn't do this in the first mock draft and opted for the more disruptive Marvin Leal, but if you're just looking for run stopping, then yes, Jordan Davis is your guy. However, keep an eye on his teammate, Devontae Wyatt. Creeping up draft boards could be an even better all-around player at the next level, and teams may just feel more comfortable using a first-round pick on a three-down defensive lineman instead of two-down. At number 18, we've got the Saints and Michael Thomas just restructured his deal and looking at the structure of that contract, they are stuck in this relationship for a while now. There's no other wide receiver under contract beyond 2022, so I still think the Saints need a dynamic deep threat to open up the underneath routes for Slant Boy, so I'm sticking with Jamison Williams here. This quarterback situation is a weird one too, but ultimately I think that Jameis Winston is their best option to bring back. This Saints team was probably a playoff team before he tore his ACL, and I'll reiterate this once again, quarterbacks just aren't of value to take in this first round. At number 19, the Eagles are back on the clock and I'm digging my heels in on this one. It's got to be a three down linebacker that can anchor the middle of this defense. N'Kobe Dean is the number one linebacker on some scheme specific draft boards and he'd have a chance to really thrive in this Eagles defense. At number 20, the Steelers are up, and it really blows my mind how so many people want their team to use a first round pick on one of these quarterbacks. Like, why? Yeah, I gave them Kenny Pickett in the previous mock draft, but that was before I heard he was doing stretches to get his hand size up. Reports are that he's got eight inch hands, and those would literally be the smallest quarterback hands in the NFL. Pair those small hands with the larger NFL ball, and you're possibly looking at a very turnover prone quarterback, especially behind the Steelers offensive line and in the Pittsburgh elements. I'm good. Kenyon Green is a top 20 player in most drafts 
classes, but because this is such a deep class along the offensive line and the fact that he was used all over the place at Texas A&M, he really didn't get a chance to dominate at one spot for long enough and establish himself. The guy is a classic road grader. This offense needs to focus on building the offense around Najee Harris, regardless of starting a quarterback. I'm good on Kenny Pickett in the first round. And honestly, I'd rather Mitch Trubisky be that mobile quarterback that Mike Tomlin is looking for that you could sign for cheap and push this first round pick towards a much safer player. At number 21, we've got the Patriots on the clock, and it's really anybody's guess as to what the Patriots do in free agency this year, because last year Belichick was uncharacteristically aggressive. Their impending JC Jackson divorce still feels like an incidental misdirection for them headed into the NFL draft, but if they are aggressive in free agency, I could see them targeting a veteran wide receiver over a veteran cornerback. Jarvis Landry just kind of feels like a Belichick guy and would be a good, reliable pairing with Mac Jones. So in the draft, let's add a really talented all around cornerback in Andrew Booth Jr. and play man, zone solid tackler hardly ever draws a flag while in man coverage i could see belichick being a little bit smitten with this kind of guy while at the same time i don't even know if he truly values the cornerback position in the draft that much because i feel like he's confident he can turn lesser known prospects into a jc jackson much like he's done with other cornerbacks in the past in fact Darrell revis and stefan gilmore are really the only two cornerbacks that i've ever seen bill belichick value highly so i really strongly considered garrett wilson here but after spending a first on Nikhil harry and him kind of being a bust and Belichick kind of running out of time. I don't know if he's going to want to wait for a rookie wide receiver to really develop into a number one guy. At number 22, we've got the Raiders on the clock. And after years of projecting John Gruden finally getting bored with their car and moving on from him, I'm wondering why now of all times that he's being talked about as a potential trade candidate. I know that he's entering the final year of his deal, but I just don't think that Josh McDaniels wants to take this job, nor was he hired with the idea of gambling with the quarterback position moving forward. I think that the Raiders need to redeem themselves from the Henry Rugg situation. And Garrett Wilson here would be a really good addition to this offense. A lot of people are higher on Garrett Wilson than this but I'm going out on a limb projecting a slight fall for him if he doesn't turn out some kind of wild testing numbers at the NFL combine if you are watching this after the combine let me know in the comments how Garrett Wilson did and if this take did in fact age poorly at number 23, we've got the Cardinals on the clock, and I think they're going to spend the offseason sucking up to Kyler Murray. And where there's smoke, there's fire. I feel like there's some truth to his request for the team to trade for CeeDee Lamb. But Kyler is hella childish if he thinks that this is the way the NFL works, because that wouldn't even fly in a Madden league. They could go wide receiver in the first to make it up to him, because AJ Green just wasn't it for Kyler. But with the top three wide receivers off the board, I'm going to go ahead and give them a new offensive lineman for Kyler to bitch at after he gets sacked. Zion Johnson has got some versatility, but best of all, he's only 6'3", so he won't block too much of Kyler's vision. Obviously, I'm kidding because he still wouldn't be able to see over him, but Zion Johnson would bring an attitude that maybe would be able to humble the little guy a little bit so he learns to keep his attitude in check. Honestly, I, I really like Kyler Murray. I like his game, but he really does have Jay Cutler level body language, but at least Cutler didn't have social media to make himself even more unlikable, and I don't want to see the same happen to Kyler. At number 23, we've got the Dallas Cowboys, and they might be moving on from Demarcus Lawrence, putting the franchise tag on Randy Gregory, leaving their pass rush up in flux, and I don't like the idea of using Micah Parsons as a full-time pass rusher. His body isn't built to do that or withstand that for 17 games, and he's going to be best utilized as a chess piece. Well, this might give Cowboys fans PTSD, but you can't scout the helmet, and David Ojabo is not Taco Charlton. If anything, Aiden Hutchinson more closely resembles Taco Charlton than Ojabo does, because David Ojabo is a much better athlete he's raw but dynamic and could overtake Chauncey Golston to become the Cowboys full-time starter in 2023 while mostly contributing as a rookie pass rush specialist at number 25 the Buffalo Bills are on the clock and their roster is hella deep with minor needs at cornerback right guard maybe the defensive line I think this is a prime spot for a trade down because as you've probably noticed the quarterbacks have all fallen and the Titans are kind of a sneaky landing place for a quarterback right after this so a team might want to leap in front of them get their guy if he's still available at this point in the draft I don't think that many of them are going to be worth it to be honest as I've mentioned but I wanted to pose the idea to you guys and see what you think for future mocks but to me George Karloff this is the best player available right now now, and he would create a very welcomed logjam of edge rushers for the Bills to ease the loss of Jerry Hughes in free agency. With Gregory Rousseau, Boogie Basham, and Carl Loftus, the Bills would have three players that could play all along the defensive line on any given down, with Ed Oliver anchoring the middle of the defensive line in a contract season. And in the AFC, they are heavy on elite quarterbacks. You're going to need guys to chase down Mahomes, Justin Herbert, Lamar Jackson. Plus, I didn't want to just reach on another cornerback here, but obviously that's one of their biggest needs. So, could still be Trent McDuffie, assuming he doesn't measure in at 5'9". 
At number 26, we've got the Titans, and I mentioned they are a dark horse to take a quarterback in the back of the first round, and that's because Ryan Tannehill makes way too much money to be playing like that in the playoffs, but also because he's only got two years left on his contract and could be pushed by having a rookie presence behind him. Even if the Titans don't plan on taking a quarterback, I'm sure that they're going to sell some interest as the 26th pick approaches, and then maybe even consider a quarterback in the second round. Instead of a quarterback here, I've got them using this first rounder to push another offensive veteran in Julio Jones. Jahan Dotson is a dynamic vertical speed threat that would solve one of the biggest issues this offense has lacked for a while now. Honestly, Kendall Wright was probably the last vertical threat that the Titans have had, and it kind of makes sense why they've avoided a player like that since. At number 27, we've got the Buccaneers, and where there's smoke, there's fire, and the rumors of the drama between Tom Brady and Bruce Arians are probably somewhat true. I think it's highly likely that we see Tom Brady back in the NFL in 2022, because as the Michael Jordan of the NFL, he's got to have a comeback, right? However, due to this rift between Brady and Arians, it's not going to be with the Buccaneers, and would likely be with another team that's unable to find a quarterback, or maybe if someone suffers an injury in training camp. The Bucs do still hold his right for the upcoming season. Season, though and they could possibly turn him into maybe a second round pick later this summer now that's if or when Brady gets that itch to come back but the Buccaneers have got to find a quarterback because no one believes Arians when he props up Blaine Gabbard as a potential starter hell Ali Marpet heard that and he went up and retired but I also don't believe that a rookie quarterback is what Arians wants to hang his hat on after Tom Brady and therefore I believe that this pick will be traded to acquire a veteran I teased this on my live stream last week but this is the best landing spot for Deshaun Watson the Bucks are all too familiar with quarterbacks that come with some sketchy baggage and obviously that's not ideal but they've shown and they've said before that they are comfortable navigating those issues. Deshaun Watson reportedly listed the Vikings and the Bucks as teams that he would waive his no trade clause for and I initially scoffed at the Bucks in favor of the Vikings but I've come around to Watson and the Bucks being the best options for both parties involved. It's probably going to take at least two first round picks but it would be so worth it for this team. They are still in win now mode and there's not many players that I think could come in and follow up Tom Brady as a franchise quarterback. So yeah Buccaneers trade this pick to the Texans. The Texans are back on the clock and they could easily snag one of these quarterbacks, but they also could auction this pick off to another quarterback needy team and then really crank out some value from the Deshaun Watson trade. On top of that, Brandon Cooks is also likely to get traded, so they could use this as a bonus pick to get one of my favorite wide receivers in this class, Chris Olave. Olave is a great route runner and vertical threat. He reminds me of Justin Jefferson, would give Davis Mills somebody to throw to other than Philip Dorsett. And honestly, it's hard to even take the Texans seriously moving into the next couple of seasons. I feel like this franchise is an a little bit of a purgatory period and unless Davis Mills turns out to be like super legit and take a huge step in his second year I anticipate that the Texans will be looking at maybe a Bryce Young next year at pick number 28, Packers are on the clock, and if you're a Packers fan, just skipping right ahead to pick number 28 to see what I say about your team and Aaron Rodgers, you might want to go back and listen to pick number 9 with the Broncos, where I actually first addressed this. I'm not going to go into Aaron Rodgers too much more, but I backtracked off my previous mock draft. He's coming back. Packers need to find ways to continue to build around him because he's now handicapping you salary cap-wise, so let's go with my man here. Bernhard, Bernhard Rain Man. Actually, just Bernard Rain Man. The Austrian freak, the tight end turn offensive tackle he's probably going to be flying up draft boards as we speak at the nfl combine and would be a great option for the packers to start at right tackle while also hedging their bets that david bakhtiari can stay healthy again for a full season at number 29, we've got the Dolphins on the clock. And with the Mike McDaniel hire, I do think that the Dolphins are now out of the Deshaun Watson sweepstakes because, man, I'd just be so messed up the Tua to drag him through all of this stuff. But at the same time, who knows? Keeping with Tua in mind, I would love to see them address this offensive line. But in this mock draft scenario, the offensive line pool has definitely been depleted at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and stick with my previous pick. I just think that Isaiah Spiller here is just too perfect of a fit for this offense. Plus, what the Dolphins have needed for quite a while. You get that fifth-year option with these late first rounders Dolphins fans let me know what I'm missing here and why this pick doesn't make sense at pick number 30 we've got the Kansas City Chiefs and I'm gonna be surprised if they bring back Tyron Matthew because this guy's about to get another big time contract for the third time in his career and I just don't know if the Chiefs are going to be able to really to afford to pay him like that like they did before and Tyron's such a strong personality I'm sure that he wears on you after a little while so ultimately I think that the Chiefs are gonna move on Daxon Hill is a safety that could creep into the first round of the NFL draft however he's more of a center field free safety type so it wouldn't surprise me if the Chiefs opted for a Jaquan Brisker, who he's no in-the-box safety, but he's definitely more of a traditional strong safety than your Daxton Hill. 
And at 31, we've got the Cincinnati Bengals. And I mentioned earlier that Laramie Tunsil was going to be traded. Once again, shout out to Balin. He mentioned this as a great opportunity for the Bengals to potentially trade for him here. And I instantly got vibes of the Ravens trading Orlando Brown to the Chiefs for this same 31st pick. It makes so much sense for the Bengals. They get a much better quality, proven starter. It gives Laramie Tunsil a chance to revive his career. As I pointed out in that live stream, the man's gotten a little bit thick around the middle doesn't seem like he's probably been training as hard can't say i blame him he's been playing on the texans so yeah here the texans are making their third first round pick and the Bengals get laramie tunsil which is perfect because the way that this played out there's not really an offensive lineman that the Bengals should take in this scenario so after going offensive line and then wide receiver i've got the texans drafting demarvin leal out of texas a and m i think in a lovey smith tampa two this is your ideal three technique and he would be great value for the texans to flip laramie tunsil for is like a bonus first round pick. All right, and then at pick 32, we've got the Detroit Lions on the clock. And after taking Malik Willis as a surprise at number two, they find themselves in the most ideal position to trade down because so many teams want to get that last pick in before the break over the first and second rounds. And with those late first round picks, you still get that fifth year option, which if you are drafting a quarterback is pretty ideal because it's the difference between a $20 million contract to a potentially $40 million contract that you will have to re-sign that guy for after three to four years anyways however i don't want to force any trades in this just to trade so i'm going to stay put for the lions and select washington cornerback trent mcduffie mcduffie has the talent to go much higher than this and by the time that you are watching this you may already know what mcduffie measured out to be he's listed at 511 there's rumors he's actually 59 it doesn't matter that much because he's mostly going to be a slot cornerback and potentially a safety down the line and lions defensive coordinator aaron glenn was a 59 cornerback so i don't believe that his size would be a reason for the Lions to pass up on him at this point and the reason that I think that he would be such a great value for the Lions despite the fact that they've already drafted a couple of quarterbacks in the past few years is solely because there's not a safety that I think that the Lions would draft this early on but I do think that McDuffie has the versatility to play a slot free safety hybrid position for them while doing my research on this mock draft I fell into quite the rabbit hole with the Lions YouTube channel watching these inside the den series from their 2021 NFL draft coverage it it was pretty cool and definitely recommended if you're a Lions fan and you haven't seen it you should definitely go back and watch it but even from a regular fan perspective it was pretty interesting to see and I love the energy and what the Lions are building right now and McDuffie just feels like one of the players that they will definitely have on their board for pick 32. And there you have it, another mock draft in the books. If it felt like I skimmed over your team's pick, it's probably because I already covered the breakdown more in depth. So you should go back and check out my last mock draft. Also, don't forget to leave a comment about who you think is a riser and faller after the NFL Combine, or just leave me your juicy NFL rumor where you think that there's a little bit of fire to the smoke. And I also started making these into TikToks, YouTube shorts. So please go and check those out after this. I wanna be able to make you guys both short and long form content, but I need a little bit of a boost from the algorithm and I need your help. Also on Thursday afternoons, I'm doing a live with my YouTube buddy Alex from Hail Mary Sports. So come and check us out. Thanks as always for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, and I will see you all in the next video.